Hi, this is Kevin. Welcome to uh, part two of my lecture on uh, uh, chapter five of the third edition of Zell's uh, Python book. Uh, in the first uh, part, we talked about uh, sequences and the fact that both uh, strings and lists were uh, both kinds of uh, sequences and they had very similar operations. Um, now in part two we're just going to talk about strings uh, in occasional far away and far right into lists but uh, primarily strings. Um, and then in part three we're going to talk about uh, files. So uh, how are they represented? So inside the computer Strings are represented as uh, sequences of ones and zeros, just like the numbers are. Uh, a string is stored as a sequence of uh, binary numbers, one number per character. It doesn't matter what value is assigned as long as it's done it, it consistently. So there's always an encoding scheme for characters, okay? And uh, it can't be arbitrary. Uh, it has to be the kind of thing that a uh, community of users agree upon. Right. In the early days of computers, each of the manufacturers used their own encoding scheme for characters. Uh, then the, we thought better of that, and we came up with a, a uh, standard called ASCII. Um, ASCII uses 127-bit uh, codes. Okay, so. Um, there still are uh, computers that use ASCII, and there and there still are um, computer languages that uh, manipulate uh, ASCII characters. But uh, Python, like all the modern programming uh, language, has uh, passed on to support a more modern set of encoding called Unicode. Okay, and uh, Unicode is notable for the fact that it uh, it supports uh, over a hundred thousand different uh, characters and uh, so in a, uh, a world where we're exchanging data from users all over the world in different languages on uh, different symbol systems a wider encoding uh, scheme uh, was really really important and uh, the world agreed on Unicode, and Unicode has been uh, kind of implemented as the standard text encoding scheme for, well, uh, 20 years, if not more. Okay? So, um, how can we find out how different characters are encoded? Well, we could do some experiments. Remember how I told you about my Frankenstein program? Well, uh, of, of course, you can do this at the command line. So there is a function called ORD, and when you give it a, a character, it gives you the numeric equivalent. So this is how it gets is stored. So a capital A is stored as a decimal 65. Okay, this isn't ones and zeros, obviously, but um, you, you'd have to go and translate the 65 into ones and zeros in order to see what's actually there in the memory. Um, you can say that you want the ord of a lowercase a, you get 97. Okay, and then you can do it uh, backwards. If you want the care of 97, it will give you a lowercase a. And if you want a care of 65, it will give you an uppercase a. So you can translate between number codes and characters uh, back and forth. Okay, you just have to know the encoding scheme. We can we can uh, figure out the encoding scheme somewhat experimentally by uh, using the function calls that you see here. Uh, so using ord and care, we can we can convert a string into and out of numeric form. The encoding algorithm is simple. Get the message to encode. For each character in the message, print the letter number of the uh, character. Uh, so a for loop iterates over a sequence of objects. 
So the for loop looks like for ch in string. No, for character in string. I have to teach you guys some good habits here. Uh, so here's a program. It's called text to numbers. Uh, a program to convert a textual message into a sequence of numbers utilizing the underlying Unicode encodings. And I, I just want to point here is that uh, this is a learning lesson. You know, would you want to do this on an everyday basis? No, probably not. But uh, sort of underlying all, all this is uh, uh, text encoding and understanding uh, that. Uh, and then uh, we're going to talk about encrypting in another couple of examples. And that's interesting, especially in a world where uh, data security is as uh, challenging as it is. Kind of understanding uh, the mechanics of encrypting is, uh, I think, useful. Um, so, um, even though these are toy programs, uh, they relate to important concepts. So, what do we do? We start by printing a, a polite explanation of what we do. Uh, then we uh, prompt to get the message to encode, uh, and then we uh, print, uh, here are the Unicode codes. Now, uh, this may be the first time I've seen where we, see it, we, we have a backslash N. There are a whole bunch of uh, characters that uh, it, it can be expressed as what we call an escape sequence. Well, what do we mean escape? Well, we mean we want the uh, we want the interpreter to escape out of its normal uh, rhythm of interpreting things as literal characters and realize that we're trying to give it a special a signal here. And the signal is, I want a new line a, a character. It's not a printable character. Okay it gives you a carriage return. When you print it, you just go down to the next line. So this is a way to skip a line, okay? If you want to skip a line at the beginning of the line, you begin with backslash n. If you want to print a line and skip an extra line, you end with backslash n. Um, there, uh, I'm sure there's a table in the textbook, and there are tables all over the internet of, uh, uh, what the escape uh, characters are in, in uh, Python strings. But um, two very popular ones we're going to use. One is the tab. It typically, that jumps over a number of uh, spaces. Uh, here's the new line, and we'll see some other ones as well. And they all begin with a backslash. So this a combination of the backslash and a character um, this is the new line escape sequence. So now we go through the message for ch because we're, we just don't have enough ink to say for character in message. Print or of the character. Um, and then we have an end. So we're going to get number, space, number, space, number, space, all the way out. So... Uh, we're going to get one line of output with number space, number space, number space, all the way out. Uh, and then we're going to print a blank line before the prompt. Okay. Uh, so now we have a program to convert messages into a type of code. Uh, but it would be nice to have a program that could decode the message. Okay. Now, uh, here's the thing. Uh, we, right now, the only kind of files that we know about, we don't even think of them as files, um, but uh, it's a kind of file, is uh, when we're working at the console. So if we uh, prompt the user and get input in, we're actually reading a record off of that file. We're reading a line of input off that file. And if we print, while well, it prints out to the console, we're printing a line of text out to the uh, console. Now, it turns out that the console is just a special file. 
okay and a lot of things happen out at the console so um, there are things that happen out there apart from the reading and the writing of uh, console input and output but there are more general files that we're going to learn about in the end of chapter five uh, in which uh, we can just uh, create a, a text file um, and we can read from uh, that a text file on the disk and instead of writing to the console we can do uh, the same thing we can write to a text file on the disk now um, this kind of thing where we're doing this uh, encoding and decoding at the console that wouldn't be a typical use case I mean if if you really wanted to encode something and decode something well it probably would be a text file okay but since we didn't get to text files explicitly yet we're fooling around with uh, things happening at the console so um, so this is the outline for the decoder uh, get the sequence of numbers to decode the message for each number in the input convert the number to the appropriate character add the character to the end of the message print the message okay um, the variable message is an accumulator variable initially set to the empty string so um, you'll remember in the previous uh, chapters we went through the accumulator pattern and the example that he had in the textbook was multiplication and when we wanted to set the uh, multiplication accumulator to a, a beginning state we set it to a one then in our uh, homework work um, with the tutorials and our assignments we were doing an accumulator that did addition and so we set the initial value to a zero and it turns out if you're accumulating text in a string variable um, you set the initial value of the accumulator variable to the empty string which is just quote quote whatever style of quotes you want to use so each time through the loop a number from the input is converted to the appropriate uh, character and appended to the end of the accumulator um, how do we get the sequence of numbers to decode uh, read the input as a single string then split it apart into substrings each of which represents one number okay now this kind of begs the question okay are we really going to get this crap from uh, console input and the answer is in real life uh, no okay but um, there's there's uh, sort of a, a more important procedural issue is um, how if we're going to get all these codes right up against each other how are we going to how are we going to consider them individually okay how can we break them apart into how can we go from uh, a string how, how can we break them apart and create a list uh, because we don't want to be picking these things out trying to index them especially if there are numbers and some of them are one digit and some are two and some are three that's going to be a nightmare right so wouldn't it be good if we were able to uh, if we were able to split the string and create a list of strings well turns out that there's a command just for that so there's a, a command called split and it's one of the methods that a string has okay so our new thing is we're going to uh, we're going to get the sequence of the numbers as a just one big string an in string we're going to split in string into a sequence of smaller strings okay that has all the parts that we want to convert one uh, in each item in a in a list so we say a sequence of smaller strings it's a list a list is the sequence um, we're gonna message is the accumulator so we're gonna set the accumulator uh, equal to the empty string uh, for each of the smaller strings 
change the string of digits into the number it represents, um, append the ASCII character for the number to the message. So uh, there's one conversion that has to go on. Remember, when we read in uh, digits, there's still uh, character strings in their own right. Uh, but we need it to be understood as a number to call the functions that we have. So we're going to have to do a conversion from the uh, from uh, the little uh, string to a number, and then we're going to use that to turn it into the character. So what would this look like? So um, so uh, the last thing we say here. Strings are objects and have useful methods associated with them. Okay, so one of the really nice things about being an object-oriented programming language like Python is that values like a string are instances of a class, um, the string class, for instance, and, string, and classes have methods. So what's really nice is, is that these objects carry around like a little toolbox of methods or a uh, function like things that can be called on them. So it, it's really handy um, that you can just call the methods on the string. And that's what we're going to do. So for instance, we have a string here, hello string methods, and we can call split on it. Okay. And what do we get back? Well, we get back a list of three strings. Well, how did it how did it decide to split it? Well, the default is it splits on the space as a divider. So it, it found two spaces and it split it twice, creating three strings. Okay, so we start with a string. Okay, we call the split method on it. If we want to use some uh, character to split it other than the space, uh, then we're going to have to put that in as an argument to split, but we're not going to do that right now. And then uh, we get back a list of substrings. It's a sweet little uh, method that's uh, tagging along with every string. So Split can be used on characters other than space by supplying the character as a parameter. So if these were comma-separated values, uh, so-called CSVs, okay, we could say to split on the comma. Okay, so if we did that, it would split like this. If it had a string that had these values separated by commas, then what we would get back would be a, uh, a list of strings. These are still strings. These are not number values um, with each value in it. Okay? So this is how you split a line of comma separated values and get back a list of strings. Okay? Um, so, if you're a, a carpenter with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're a mathematician, like uh, our friend John Zell, everything looks like math. So, the first thing he thinks of is, oh, wow, we could get the x and y values for some kind of a point in geometry uh, by uh, doing this. Well, I guess <laughs> I'm not going to worry about it. Don't you worry about it either. Um, so uh, here's a program that converts uh, the uh, Unicode numbers. Uh, so it's a string of these y Unicode numbers uh, uh, separated by uh, commas, I think. Well, uh, so, oh, I'm sorry. This is, uh, please enter the Unicode encoded message. And then we go through and we pick it apart. Again, 
uh, this is kind of interesting, but but now um, it kind of strains uh, credibility. Like I could understand that we would have done the other one, the encode, that we would type in uh, a list of text and it would give us back the uh, encoded numeric equivalent. But can you think of a person who would actually type this list of uh, numbers at the keyboard? Perhaps you have some kind of CIA analyst who's trying to get this thing decoded and they're going to type it all in. Uh, probably not, okay? It's probably going to, you know, the numbers are probably going to be on an encoded file somewhere on the disk. And more likely, uh, what the user is going to be doing is pointing uh, the program to that file and it's going to be read in. So this, this kind of, uh, we really have to suspend a, a bit disbelief if we believe uh, a user is going to uh, type in this string of uh, numbers. Okay, but we just go through and we uh, we decode them. Okay, now what's interesting here, what we see here, is look up where up here we take the accumulator variable message and we start it out as an empty string. Okay, then every time we we uh, decode uh, a character. We say message equals message plus a uh, care of code num. Okay? And so it looks like what we're doing is we're changing the string message, right? And we're just adding something on the end of it. I just want to point out, and we'll see some new code in a couple of minutes. Uh, you can't do that to strings. You can appear to do it uh, to strings, but strings are truly unchangeable. So what happens when you appear to add a character to the end of a string? Well, what happens is that uh, Python, under the covers, creates a whole new string and then points the variable method at the new longer uh, string. So, uh, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and it doesn't make a sound, um, you know, did it really fall? Well, I guess it did. Um, so the fact is that there's a lot of new string creation going on here that's not obvious, okay? And I think eventually we get to some code that shows us how we can, we can avoid the inefficiency of creating a new character string every time we go through the loop, okay? When you just look at the code, um, to the uneducated eye, it looks like we're just growing message. But what we really have is we have a series of things that are pointed to with a variable uh, uh, message. And each one, every time we come through, it's another one longer character uh, string. Okay? Uh, it's kind of depressing, but that's the way Python actually works under the covers. Okay, so the split function produces a sequence of strings. Num strings gets each successive substring. Each time through the loop, the next substring is converted to the appropriate Unicode character and appended to the end of the message. Um, so here's where we ran it. And I, I guess the message that he had here, uh, CS120 is fun. Well, I guess. Okay, now, we've done a bit of that. Let's learn some more of the methods that come uh, as part of the string object. This is a really powerful part of these object-oriented languages. When you take these uh, value objects and you implement them as uh, instances of uh, classes, then they can have all these methods. And uh, it's kind of like I said before, it's like a toolbox that it carries around with it. So if you say, if you call the method capitalize on S, 
uh, you'll get a copy of S with only the first character uh, capitalized. And this is really important, copy of S. Why doesn't it go and change the first character of S? Well, you know what? Strings are immutable. You can't change them. So it may look like you're changing, you're changing S, but on all of these things, you get back a new copy. Now, if you read your code, it looks like, it, it really looks like you're changing the contents of S. But lo and behold, S is just fine. It's uncapitalized. The new value is, uh, uh, has the initial character uh, capitalized. Uh, we say, s.title so we get a copy of s um, it's in title uh, uh, case the first character of each word is uh, capitalized um, we can say we want to center a field so if the field has a given width it will uh, evenly place white space in the beginning and white space in the end so that it appears to be centered within that number of characters. Come on. Um, we, can, we can ask for the count of a substring. Okay, so we count the number of occurrences of substring S in S. So it could be a single character, or it could be a combination of characters. Uh, we, could, we could ask it to find a substring. So it's going to find the first position where the sub occurs in S. Now that's a position, that's an index. That starts counting at 0. The one before was a count, it starts counting at 1. Uh, there's this really cool... Uh, um, a command uh, called join. It's a little bit hard to understand, but what we do is there are a lot of times when what we would like to do is we would like to take a list of strings and we would like to join them and put some character in between each one of them. Well, it would depend on what the strings represented what the character would be. Like, for instance, uh, if these strings were all just uh, characters that are part of one word, well, we don't want to put anything in between them. So we probably would use the empty string. So we would say empty string dot join list. Uh, if these were individual words, right, well, then we would want to put a space between them. So we would have single space dot join list. Uh, what if we wanted to separate each of them by a comma space? Well, we would say, uh, in quotes, comma space dot join list. So it's a really nice way to take a list of things that you've been accumulating in a list and join them into a unified character or string and what you use as the join uh, character or characters or no character all in the case of the empty string, uh, that gets placed in between uh, the items on the list. Um, and there, there are a lot of tricks to be done with that. Uh, so we can say L just. It's like the center, but it's left uh, justified. So all the white space is going to go to the right side. Whoop, having a hard time getting to the next, uh, there we are. Now, lower, you get a copy of S in all lowercase. L strip, a copy of S with the leading white space removed. Um, S replace. So we can take an old substring and replace it with a new substring. Uh, now, do we actually change S? No, we don't. You can't change a string. It's immutable. 
So what we get is we get a new copy with this uh, substitution uh, acted upon. Uh, we we have our find this sub. Uh, it's like find, but it begins on uh, on the right side. So uh, what happens is if there are three occurrences of the substring in S, it's going to point to the beginning of the last one. Uh, then we have R just. Um, it's going to make it right uh, justified. It, it's going to um, take the white space and put it on the left side. Uh, R strip. So you get a copy of S with the, the with the trailing white space removed. Uh, it, it split. We've already seen that splint s into a list of substrings we can say upper copy of s all characters conveyor converted to uppercase so these are all methods of strings and i just want to point out that even though you can kind of think of it as changing the string you never change the string if you get a new value, it's always a copy. Okay? Now, why did they do that? Well, it turns out that for certain reasons of uh, computer programming language architecture uh, 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 decisions, objects that are not uh, changeable um, are very efficient and very reliable. And so it... it it helps. It makes the problem more solvable from mm, a computational perspective. Um, if you can have certain things, you can count on them not to change. And that's what they decided to do with strings. Okay? Um, they're still happy about it. It may seem odd to you and I, uh, but... Uh, that's the way that they work. So you, you have to you have to pinch yourself every once in a while and say, I'm not really changing the string. I'm not really changing the string. I'm really getting a new copy. My code might look like it's changing. In my mind, I might think like it's changing, but I'm really getting a new one. Okay, so it turns out that lists also have methods. And they're kind of related to some of the methods we have for strings because, again, aren't lists sequences? Strings are sequences. Lists are sequences. Wouldn't they have some kind of parallel operations? Yeah, they do. OK? So um, you can use the append method to add an item to the end of a list. Now, could you do that for a string? No, you couldn't because, yeah, wait for it, strings are immutable, they're unchangeable. So this is a difference. Okay, so uh, pretty typically when we're trying to build a, a list, um, we, uh, uh, we, we often uh, just say that, uh, we want to append a value to the end of the list. So it just becomes one longer and it puts the value in there. Here we're doing that with some kind of, with a list called squares. We're getting the squares. Is it from one to 101? Nope. This is the first one we don't want. So we have the squares on from one to 100. Okay and it goes up to 10,000, which is 100 squared. Okay, well that worked fine. Okay, so one of the things is that if we're doing this kind of manipulation when we're adding things, it turns out even if we want to do this with small bits of text, text you'll see, and we'll see an example before we get too far along, that what people will do is that they will use a list while they're processing the text and then they'll uh, turn it into a string when they're done. Why? Well, because lists are mutable. Okay. So if you have some kind of a, 
if you have some kind of a loop where you add a bit of text on at the end each time, well, if you're adding a bit of text into the list, well, you're not creating a new, you're not wiping out uh, the old object or making the old object a candidate for garbage collection and creating a new. So it's somewhat less wasteful. Uh, so we can use an alternative approach in the decoder program. You remember originally what we're doing is that the accumulator is a, a, a character is string. So every time we append to it, we throw away the old one and we create a new one. Okay, well, that seems kind of wasteful. Uh, okay, maybe we could do something else. And that's how we're going to use a list for processing uh, text. Uh, so we can avoid this by recopying by using lists of characters where each new character is appended to the end of the existing list. Since lists are mutable, the list is changed in place without having to copy the content over to a new object. Okay, so the cost, the computing cost is uh, potentially considerably less. When done, we can use the join method of the list to concatenate the characters into a string. How about that? So what did we get out of that? We got efficiency. We got computing efficiency. And also, it's a little bit easier to visualize this, okay? We, we're adding things to the list, even if it's a character at a time. And then is, at the very end, we're, we're joining it all together. So uh, what did we do here? Well, in this next version, uh, numbers to text 2, Okay, uh, sorry, we've got um, we've got a variable called uh, cares. Uh, this is the list, and it starts out empty. Okay, and then and when we go through the loop, every time we have a new character, we append it. Okay, so um, we build them up. To, uh, their single character character strings and we just keep adding them in as items in the list. Then when we're done we say this is really uh, tricky we say well we want to join all the things in the list uh, cares what do we want to put between the members uh, nothing at all the empty string. So this is kind of funny because this uh, join um, is a uh, is a, a method or property of a string and what's uh, kind of amazing is it's even a property of the empty string right so um, the empty string is saying use me to join all of the items in uh, in uh, the list uh, cares and put me nothing at all in between the cares so you wind up with a single character string with all the characters with nothing in between them because uh, we use the empty string to join them now why did we do that it's more efficient okay that's all Okay, so uh, I'm going to take a pause for a second. I'll, I'll be right back. Okay, now the next part of the chapter is interesting, uh, uh, but uh, could be could like it could take you down a rabbit hole. Okay, uh, but certainly people over in the computer science uh, department are interested in encrypting uh, text and uh, decrypting uh, text. And this uh, whole science is called cryptography. And it's just like the encoding and the decoding that we've seen uh, in uh, the programs that we just did, except that uh, there's a secret formula, 
Okay, so we were encoding and decoding according to a standard formula, and in cryptography, we tried to do it according to some secret formula, so only people in the know can do the other side, right? And uh, it's kind of interesting. I mean, there are all kinds of translational things that we can do with data, um, and provided that we keep enough information, um, we can transform something and we can transform it back. If we keep enough information, uh, well then we can do a complete transformation back. If we do, uh, if we squeeze some information out, we often call that a, in information science, we, science, we call that a lossy transformation which means we lose some information and if we wanted to transform it back we couldn't do it because we lost some of the detail that we need uh, so in uh, cryptography we're trying to come up with non-lossy transformations of the data that make it easy to hide the meaning from uh, people who uh, we don't want to know the meaning uh, our competitors, our e e enemies, our children, our parents, <laughs> right? All those things. So there's a bunch of slides here in a row that talk about uh, cryptography. And really, uh, it's just the encoding that we saw before plus um, uh, one, one extra uh, step to obscure things. And I'm just going to go through them pretty quickly. And I'm going to see if there's anything else I want to talk about in this. Because this isn't a course about uh, encryption. Well, they talk about uh, private key versus uh, public key encryption. And if this were a security course, I think that would be interesting. Certainly meaningful you to, meaningful for you to read but um i'm teaching you to be a python programmer uh uh not a security analyst we'll let one of my colleagues uh, do that uh here's the public key versus private key and um okay so now we're back to stuff that um i think you really need to know as part of my course and this is uh Sometimes on either input or output, we want to manipulate the string. Um, in, in essence, we want to transform it from one format to another format. Okay, uh, we might want to say, as he says here on the slides, pretty it up. So suppose we had a, a kind of a shorthand date 05 24 2015, and we wanted it to come out May. 24th comma 2015 okay how could we do that well I want you to think of two things one is the first thing I want you to think of I'll bet there's code that's part of the Python distribution that will do that for me in one command okay okay now forget about that what if we had to do it ourselves Okay, that's the question he's asking. Okay, because there is there is code to be called that will do that in one fell swoop. Okay. Uh, so what does he want to do? He wants to create a new date string in the form month space day comma year. Uh, I'll put the new date string. Um. So. We're going to enter the date string. Now we're going to do a typical, uh, a typical uh, thing. We're going to ask it to split on uh, the slash. So we're going to get three strings. Okay. The split, um, the split method for the string is is just really powerful. Okay. Um, the other thing that we do, this is, he says, we unpack it. So split, we're expecting to throw off three values. And if you remember from earlier in the course, we can put three 
variables over here and catch each of the parts the month the day the year and that's what he does uh, this is very Pythonic uh, Python uh, people like to do this uh, could you do it some other way yeah you could uh, but this is pretty good documentation and uh, uh, I like it it's Pythonic okay okay uh, the next step is to convert the month string into a number so we can use the int function uh, to convert 05 to the integer 5 and we've done this before when we were doing input okay well you can just uh, call int on a string and it's going to give you the integer equivalent or blow up Okay, if there's no integer equivalent of it, if it has a decimal point or it says, hi, mom, kaboom. Okay, we'll learn how to catch the kaboom uh, in a later chapter. Uh, note that eval would work. And then he says, but it doesn't work with leading zeros. Uh, eval has been discredited as insecure. Forget about eval. He ought to forget about eval. I, I think uh, this was a slide that he had from the last version of this book where he was uh, singing the praises of eval. And in the meantime, it's been uh, discredited. Okay? But it wouldn't work anyway. So uh, the heck with eval. Okay? Um, so... What, how can we uh, do the month? Well, we just have a list with the months. Okay, that's not too hard to do. Um, so he has month string equals months. Uh, and then he wants to int month string minus one. Okay, and again, this is in square brackets. So this is going to be an index uh, for months. Okay, I'm really proud that he used uh, real variable names. So uh, these are uh, what I would call big boy variable names. The kind of uh, variable names you could use on the job and not be embarrassed when you turn your code in. Okay. Um, and then we print the output. So he can go from 0123 2010 to uh, this. So, again, uh, why did we do this? Well, we did it this way. We did it by hand because we wanted to learn about um, how to split a, a date string apart with split and then how to do the processing. Um, again, is there, a, is there a function to call that would uh, do this for us automatically or some expression that we could use? Absolutely, there is. Okay, but we want you to learn how to do it by hand uh, just for your training. Sometimes we want to convert a number into a string. Okay, I want to go the other way. So uh, we can just say stir for string of a, a value and it'll print out that value. Okay. Uh, now, why would we want to do that? We already know that if we just use value here, it'll say the value is space, and it'll turn whatever it's in value into um, into a string for us. Well, what if we wanted to? Uh, if, what if we wanted to concatenate the string representation of that value with a period right next to it? Well, to do this, we'd have to turn value into a string. Then this plus is going to mean concatenation. Okay? So we're not saying that every time you print out a number that you have to, you have to explicitly ask for the string value of it. But we're saying that when you, want to, uh, when you want to concatenate or glue a period right up to the right side of it, uh, this is how you do it. Uh, and he says that there. Uh, 
Uh, so we now have a complete set of type conversion operations. We can ask for a float, we can ask for an, in, uh, an int, we can ask for a string, and forget about eval. Eval is, is on the evil list. Okay, and this is another uh, this is another uh, thing that he just forgot to uh, change. Uh, formatting. We're going to talk about formatting uh, quickly, and then uh, it'll be the end of uh, part two. So there are times when you want to uh, take a number, especially when you're using floating point numbers like we are, uh, to represent money. You want to make sure that you get just the digits you do. Here we're saying we're getting 1.5 instead of dollar fifty. So how can we print out uh, uh, things given a format? Well, it turns out that we have this. Uh, we we kind of do like we did with the split. We have a string that holds a format. Okay, so it's odd. It's the property of a string. So we have a format string, okay, and then we call format on the format string, and then we pass it the number uh, that we want to be uh, considered. So when we do this, it's, it says here, uh, your total value of your change is 150. So we got the dollar sign, okay, and then we got the two decimal points. Now, how do you pull that apart and understand it more generally? Well, we have the template string dot format, and then we have a list of values, okay? These fill in places or slots in the template string. The one that we had before only had one slot. So you have slots, and each slot has a description that includes a format specifier telling Python how the value for the slot should appear. Now we had just one. Okay, so it contains, uh, this one that we have here contains a single slot with a description uh, 0 colon 0 0.2f. Uh, the first one is the uh, index. So this says which of the values am I talking about? Well, we start counting with zero. So total's going to go into slot zero. This is slot zero. And 0 0.2f says um, what the format should be. It's a floating point with two decimal places. The, the formatting specifier has the form width precision type where f means, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean floating point, it means fixed point, which is actually the opposite. Um, width tells us how many spaces to use to display the value. Zero means to use as much space as necessary. And the precision is the number of decimal places. So if we back up, you'll see uh, we had zero wide, which means use just uh, the space that you need two decimal places, F means fixed, which is why we got what we got. Um, what else have we got? That's what we just said. We were just there. These are examples of how this works. Um, uh, there's more information here about how to use the formatting strings. For instance, we can use a less than or the greater than sign to say that we want to justify things. Uh, we can use the circumflex to say that we want to center it. Okay, so these are, these are ways to, to get the numeric output to look just as we would like it to. Um, now, uh, here's some advice that is, I think, a half step, okay? One problem that we have with floating point numbers or uh, floats is that they don't keep as much precision as we might like uh, for accounting, 
for uh, dollars and cents. I mean, they keep a lot of digits, but if we were working for a, uh, you know, a multi-billion dollar organization, um, they probably would not be the best. We probably would start to lose precision in our accounting. Um, so the the naive uh, solution to that is to keep everything in ints. Okay, just count pennies instead of dollars, and then uh, uh, convert them on the way out. Well, it turns out that there are other uh, numeric types, like the decimal numeric type, which would allow us to control uh, the precision that we had and the formatting. So the fact is that in the real world, if we were worried about um, this issue, we probably wouldn't take this half step of counting pennies. We would probably learn about the decimal type and go use that. Okay? And uh, so we would need to do some uh, divides. Um, here's a place to use integer uh, division. Uh, so this is integer uh, division, and this is the uh, uh, this is the modulo operator. So that's a use for that if, if you want to turn uh, dollars and cents into dollars and uh, pennies. And then we have a program to do it. Okay, now I, I, I just want to say that, that that's an interesting progression in the way that you think about uh, numeric uh, data types and the way that you might deal with the potential imprecision of uh, floats. But, uh, uh, and it's, there probably are some people in their day job who use that approach, um, but it's, it's, it's a kind of amateurish halfway uh, solution. If you really have that problem, then you ought to go out and use the decimal uh, class. Um, there's one more thing, and we talked about this before, the, uh, the escape uh, sequence uh, backslash n uh, marks the marks a line break. So it's possible to have a string that's got two or three or 25 or 400 lines in it because it has these new line uh, characters in it. Okay? And we'll take advantage of that over time. And is there anything else we want to say? Nope. So I'm going to say bye now, and I'll be back for part three uh, before you know it, and we'll be talking about uh, files, which are the third kind of sequence, right? So all the things we're talking about in, in the chapter, uh, strings, lists, and files are different kinds of sequences. So they share a lot of common properties. Um, the most powerful one is the ability to process all three with the for in syntax. See you in part three. Bye-bye.